All right, I wanted to make a little lecture on a couple of fallacies and contradictions um, related to Nietzsche's philosophy. As um, I mentioned in the outset of the semester, Nietzsche is um, one of those thinkers whose ideas um, raise questions about what counts as philosophy, what counts as good philosophy, and how to do philosophy. He doesn't write philosophy the way that most other academics tend to go about doing it, especially con in contemporary philosophy, but even in his own own time period as well. And so in this presentation, we're going to cover a couple of, uh, a, a little bit of background on two informal fallacies and self-contradiction for you to keep in mind while we're studying Nietzsche's philosophy. So like other philosophers, life of the mind type people, academics and intellectuals, you know, educators. Nietzsche endorses the virtues of critical thinking, questioning tradition, uh, you know, questioning popular opinion and trends or, or convention. Um, and in many ways, he's, he's a radical questioner because his philosophy uh, amounts to, or his thought, let's call it that for now, amounts to a critique of both traditional, much of traditional Western culture and certainly lots of Western philosophy particularly those philosophical beliefs that inform culture, uh, including things about morality, truth, and objectivity, and impartiality. And so Nietzsche is an endorser, like other philosophers, of critical thinking. As you recall, last time I gave you this definition from an intro textbook that I have used uh, previously and, and often use still um, to give us a technical definition of, of academic philosophy, right? So here we could think of philosophy as the intellectual activity of attempting to discern and remove contradictions among non-empirical reason beliefs that have universal importance with the resulting benefit of achieving a greater understanding of the world and our place within it, right? So um, notice it talks about attempting to discern and remove contradictions. So built into this idea of, of what philosophy is, is avoiding contradictions, right? And if we're going to resolve contradictions between um, different rival beliefs or, you know, there are more than two often. Um, so it could be a, 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 not just an either or, but, you know, it could be three or four different positions we have to worry about. And they can't all be true. So we got to figure out what are the arguments um for each one of those and the criticisms of those arguments and measure and weigh their relative strength and, and weight to try to figure out what the, the most plausible answer is, most likely answer is, right? So that involves using logic, critical thinking, and avoiding things like contradictions and fallacies. So logic is the area of philosophy that studies formal principles of good and bad reasoning. When we talk about good and bad reasoning in philosophy, or in logic, we don't simply mean effective for producing belief in people. That's what we mean by rhetoric here, or as we might say, mere rhetoric, as I've defined it down there at the bottom, again, coming from Klosowski. And then this idea of critical thinking, right? In order to figure out what's true, we have to subject things to critical scrutiny. And so this would be the purposeful self-regulatory judgment, which results in interpretation, analysis, evaluations, and inference as well as explanation of evidential, conceptual, methodological, criteriological, or contextual consideration upon which judgment is based. So, you, you know, how do we improve our thinking? How do we question and uh, revise our beliefs in accordance with evidence and good reasons, right? We can contrast then philosophy and sophism, where sophism is the use of mere rhetoric to produce belief in people through non-rational means, often fallacious means or, or you know, emotionally manipulative means. Um, so sophists, uh, they invariably in employ rhetoric, as Klosowski writes here, hoping to selfishly benefit from changing the attitudes of those hearers and readers of their words. Philosophers hope to persuade only through knowledge and rational processes. Therefore, philosophers do not view rhetoric as a good for its own sake. Argumentation is available because it proves to be an effective instrument for seeking the truth. If the truth is found, then there's no guarantee that one additional uh, that one additionally benefits. Sometimes the truth hurts. The end goal, discovering the truth, is a non in non-empirical, universally important matters, is intrinsically valuable. So finding the truth is its own reward and um, no additional or selfish centered motivations or benefits uh, need be involved. The differences between the philosopher and the sophist are thus important, even if sometimes subtle, which is why Socrates spent so much time distancing himself from sophistry. And so another way of kind of 
posing our question here is, you know, is Nietzsche more of a philosopher or more of a sophist? And the reason I asked that question is because Nietzsche, well, he often praised the sophists. He often endorses philosophical views associated with sophism, including relativism, skepticism, and forms of egoism. Um, he is also, like the sophist, often criticized for offering fallacious and self-contradictory or gener having generally specious reasoning to support his views. And so again, you know, is Nietzsche more of a philosopher or more of a sophist? And again, I mentioned he praised the sophist, and he says here the sophists were those people who cultivated the art of dialectic to the such an extent that they could argue for any position, thus revealing the relative and conventional nature of human beliefs and customs. And he goes on, he says, it's not enough to prove something, just like the philosopher would want to do. He says, one has to seduce or elevate people to it. So pause there for a second. Does that mean, you know, using sophistry to uh, seduce or elevate people to it instead of rational argumentation. So he says, that, he goes on, that's why the, main, the man of knowledge uh, should learn how to speak his wisdom and often in such a way that it sounds like folly. Right? So Nietzsche is placing an emphasis on rhetoric there like the sophists. Um, and this kind of gets us up to speed uh, to or dovetails with rather the article that I had you read for today on the Colbert way of doing philosophy, where they introduce, you know, relativism of a couple of different sorts, uh, this idea of truthiness, right? The idea that um, gut thinking or our, in, our, our uh, uncritical intuitions tell us what's true or false, or the quality of preferring concepts or facts one wishes to be true rather than concepts or facts known to be true, right? This comes from Stephen Colbert's old show, The Colbert Report, where he introduced that. And then in the reading, Johnson, the article author, goes on to talk about doing philosophy and how that involves the principle of charity. So interpreting, you know, uh, our, the other positions in the, the, the strongest, best possible way. We want to avoid contradictions, as we've already mentioned. It rejects do, uh, sophistry, relativism, at least simple relativism, truthiness, uh, what Fr Harry Frankfurt calls BS, gut thinking, or what Locke called enthusiastic thinking. Again, truthiness, right? We have epistemic rights, or philosophy restricts its epistemic rights to what's rationally justifiable. Um, it may appeal to intuition where those intuitions are plausibly universal or have near universal agreements and only use those kinds of intuitions as evidence for arguments. It's going to always have a concern for the true versus the false and figuring out what is true versus what is false or illusory. Um, it's going to involve uh, an obligation to support one's views with good evidence and logical reasoning. So the burden of proof lies on the arguer to prove their point. Um, it, it emphasizes abandoning unsupported beliefs and remaining agnostic when there's insufficient evidence or arguments to settle an issue, um, even if it's just probabilistically settling the issue. Right. And so Johnson wraps up saying we shouldn't be relativists. Uh, thinking that groups or individuals can determine what's true. We also shouldn't be gut thinkers believing our intuition can be enough uh, justification for controversial beliefs. Rather, we should defend our positions with arguments, and when we can't defend them, we should give them up. We need to have a concern for the truth and try our best to find out what's true. And when we realize we don't have enough evidence to draw an informed conclusion about something, we should be agnostic and admit, like Socrates, that we simply do not know the answer instead of hiding behind some kind of right to an opinion. No one's questioning or denying that you have a formal right to believe whatever you want. The question here is what do we have epistemic rights to? What do we have rational rights to? What can be justified? What can be proven, even if just probabilistically? So he goes on, all these mistakes are tempting when doing philosophy because philosophical questions are so hard to answer. It's easy to give up and think that there's no answer and just appeal to the majority or your gut or the right to believe whatever you want. However, the fact that the answer is hard doesn't mean entail, doesn't entail that the answer is not there. Philosophy does make progress. It just takes a while. By engaging in the philosophical endeavor, you're taking part in a very large, long process that answers the most important questions a person can ask. They don't that they won't all be answered in your lifetime, but you should be able to discover answers that you can at least defend with rational argumentation. Right? So again, from, from Johnson there. So philosophy can be thought of as, you know, the critique of truthiness to figure out what's true. So this brings us around to arguments 
and particularly self-contradictions and fallacious arguments. These are, of course, errors in reasoning that we need to avoid. We always, in philosophy class and in logic class, are concerned to have cogent and sound arguments that are free of factual errors, uh, logical errors, logical falsehoods, so false premises, fallacies, or contradictions. Any of those three kinds of errors, a false premise, a fallacy, or a self-contradiction is bad for the argument. It can devastate the argument. And of course, there are many different arguments usually that can be given for a single position, so just because one version of the argument's bad doesn't mean all the others are. You have to go through all of them. Right? And so before we get to these two fallacies in particular for Nietzsche class, let's rehearse this idea of an argument in philosophy. So I don't mean a debate or an, just a disagreement between uh, two or more people or two or more parties, or maybe a disagreement with yourself right, where you're uh, not of a single mind. Um, so by an argument, we mean a group of propositions that try to prove something. There'll be at least one premise that expresses the reason or the evidence for the other proposition, the conclusion. So it's got to have at least two. Many arguments have many, many more than just two propositions, but it'll have at least two propositions, at least one premise and a conclusion. Often there are many other premises uh, leading to a final conclusion or an, a large complex argument made up of several small sub-arguments. And so reasoning is a matter of supporting the truth of one claim with the truth of some other claims that are already known to be true. And sometimes people are tempted to think that all arguments are equally good, or it's all just when it comes to logic, just in the eye of the beholder, the same way that taste or beauty might be. But this, of course, is a pretty hard position to maintain. Um, coherently at least. So just take a look at this argument here. Here's a classic example of an argument laid out in what's called proper or standard form where the premises are stated in the order at which they lead to the final conclusion listed on the bottom. So here we have two premises and a conclusion in line three. We've got all human beings are mortal. Socrates is a human being, thus Socrates is mortal. So we've got this universal uh, first premise uh, where we have a Mortality applies to all the beings that count as human beings, right, um, universally then. And then Socrates is a particular human being. So if uh, being mortal applies to all human beings and Socrates is a particular human being, that means Socrates is mortal as well, right? So there's a deductively valid sound argument for the mortality of Socrates. Now here's another argument. Notice it starts off with the same first two premises, all human beings are mortal. Socrates is a human being. But here we have a different conclusion. Thus, Socrates likes cheese. Well, look, those arguments aren't equally good. Um, Socrates' preference for cheese or any other food um, has nothing to do and doesn't follow from the fact that he's mortal and that all human beings are mortal. So Nothing at all about Socrates' food preferences follows from the fact that all human beings are mortal and that Socrates is a human being as well, right? So that conclusion doesn't follow. That gets us to the idea of a premise of a of a, a fallacy. Right? So what is a fallacy? It's a type of error in reasoning, but it's not the same as a false premise. So um fallacy. Sometimes you might hear this phrase, non sequitur, the Latin phrase that means it does not follow, used um, generally to mean a fallacy. It might be used also more narrowly and more strictly as a form, kind of formal fallacy, but the phrase itself just means it does not follow, and that gets us to the idea of, of a fallacy. The conclusion, the truth of the conclusion, doesn't follow from the truth of the premises, even if those premises are true. So a little bit more of a technical definition then is a fallacy is an argument whose premises do not support its conclusion, is one whose conclusion could be false even if all its premises were true. So the truth of the conclusion doesn't follow probabilistically or necessarily, depending on the type of argument, from the truth of the premises. In cases this kind of reasoning is bad and the argument said to be fallacious, a fallacy is an error in reasoning. As logicians use the term fallacy, however, it designates not any mistaken inference or false belief, but typical errors, that, uh, that is, mistakes which commonly occur in ordinary discourse and devastate the arguments in which they appear. We therefore define a fallacy as a type of argument that would be seen correct, but one upon examination uh, not be so. 
again, the, the error here is that the truth of the conclusion doesn't follow from the truth of the premises, even if they are in fact true. So it does not follow fallacy. So another way of defining this is that a fallacy is a faulty reasoning that inappropriately or incorrectly draws a conclusion from evidence that does not support the conclusion. In other words, it doesn't support the truth of the conclusion. So again, from Klazowski, an error in reasoning, albeit not due to a false premise, such that the conclusion could still be false, even if the premises are true. So again, the truth of the conclusion doesn't follow either probabilistically or necessarily from the truth of the premises. So it's, it's, um, it's the, the conclusion is either possibly still false or more likely false than true. So a fallacy, you know, again, just to rehearse a little bit, may be used commonly in everyday language to mean a false belief, but in philosophical writing, academic writing, you're going to see that more technical definition of a, a conclusion that doesn't follow from the truth of the premises. Um, uh, again, inductively invalid or inductively weak. Fallacies are common. They occur all the time. They can occur by accident or they can be um, used intentionally to try to manipulate people in sophism, propaganda, or truthiness. Right? And they come in two basic forms, either formal or informal fallacies. That fallacy that I gave you about Socrates and cheese, that's an example of a formal fallacy having to do with the structure of the argument, the relationship between subject and predicate in those syllogisms. And a informal fallacy, which is a reasoning error due to the content and context of the argument, not just its underlying formal structure. So again, here, uh, an example of those two different um, invalid formals or formal fallacies um, there with that Socrates argument, and the Socrates and Cheese argument as well. And then there are many, many informal fallacies. Hundreds of these things. Aristotle is one of the first to um, to start cataloging them. He's also where we get our first formal system of logic. And uh, we're not going to go over all of these. Um, there's information on Moodle for you uh, to go over many of the many of the other ones here. I'm going to focus on ad hominem and genetic fallacies because those are the two that Solomon discusses in regard to Nietzsche's philosophy uh, in the book that we're reading this semester and are often brought up by other philosophers and in, in commentators on Nietzsche's philosophy as well. So, you know, I've got a list here of several different types of fallacies, an appeal to emotion, appeal to force, appeal to inappropriate authority, argument against the person or ad hominem, appeal to the people, hasty generalization, weak analogy, straw man, red herring, equivocation, where two different meanings of the same term are conflated in an argument, and the genetic fallacy based on origins. And so again, we won't go through all of these here. If you need help with the other ones, there is additional help on Moodle. Uh, for you or online for you to find. We're going to focus on ad hominems and the genetic fallacy and then that idea of a self-contradiction. So here's an argument um, stated more in everyday conversational form rather than a uh, proper or standard form. So relativism is the view that there are no universal truths, but the only people who espouse this view are immoral reprobates attempting to rationalize their horrible behavior. So obviously relativism is, uh, is incorrect. That should say uh, incorrect there. Let's make a little correction. So that should be incorrect. So this is an example of an ad hominem, particularly the ad hominem abusive fallacy. And it occurs when instead of attacking the argument and looking for errors of fact, fallacy, or self-contradiction in that argument, we attack the person of the, who gave the argument. So it's like attacking the messenger, not the message. Attacking the arguer, not the argument. Um, so whenever that occurs, it's said to commit the ad hominem fallacy. It means against the person or attack against the person. And this kind of fallacy comes in multiple forms. Um, there's an abusive form, a circumstantial variety, the two quoque or the you also version, poisoning the well and guilty by association. And I've come up with some examples here, some of which, um, you know, use Nietzsche in them. So 
uh, for example, of a ad hominem abusive um, against Nietzsche. We have here, Nietzsche was a rabid anti-religious bigot. Obviously, his philosophy can't be true. So if we're saying his philosophy has to be all false because he's this ant he has this bigotry, looks like a, an ad hominem abusive attack. Circumstantial, uh, attacking the person's circumstances, not necessarily a character trait or an attribute or a motive that they have, but the circumstances that might give them reason to argue one or another thing. So Nietzsche's father was a Lutheran minister, but obviously he must have had some kind of unhappy religious upbringing to make him reject Christianity. So I don't even take his whole God is dead thing seriously. So again, another uh, circumstantial ad hominem way of dismissing Nietzsche's claims. Two quoque. This one's based on a charge of hypocrisy, where the um, hypocrisy between what a person expresses and their own behavior or the inconsistency there is said to make their conclusion or their belief false, when really it's just a problem with their, their conduct, not necessarily the truth or falsity of what they said. Poisoning the well is like a preemptive ad hominem. It's like me telling you, you know, don't go trust those people over there, anything they say, um, you know, because they're bad people or they're all trying to indoctrinate you. Um, so then when you show up and listen to, to them, you know, you don't really take what they say seriously or give it a fair shot because the well has been poisoned in advance there. And then a guilty by association version of the ad hominem. So Nazis were huge fans of Nietzsche. Uh, so obviously... Uh, his philosophy is morally bankrupt, right? Because the Nazis were so bad. So anybody associated or that would be liked by the Nazis must also be as bad as Nazis, right? Uh, so those are some ad hominems, some of which are ad hominem attacks against Nietzsche. But the reason we need to worry about this is not just because of ad hominem attacks against Nietzsche, but because Nietzsche sometimes seems to give ad hominem arguments against other philosophers, like Socrates, for example, where he attacks him for his ugliness, uh, in this passage from Twilight of the Idols here. So just to read it all the way through quickly here. In origin, Socrates belonged to the lowest class. Socrates was plebes. We know, he, uh, we can still see for ourselves how ugly he was, but ugliness itself, uh, in itself, an objection is among the Greeks, almost a refutation. Uh, was Socrates a Greek at all? Ugliness is often enough to express the development of uh, that has been crossed, thwarted by crossing, or it appears as declining development. The anthropologists among the criminologists tell us that the criminal is ugly, right? So was Socrates a typical criminal? At least would uh, this be contradicted by the famous judgment of his uh, physiognomist, uh, which sounded so offensive to the friends of Socrates, a foreigner who knew about faces once passed through Athens and told Socrates his face was that of a monster, that he harbored in himself all the bad vices and appetites. Socrates answered, you know me, sir. So is that an ad hominem? Does that amount to an ad hominem dismissive uh, argument against, uh, against Socrates there by Nietzsche? I mentioned Solomon brings up ad hominems in regard to Nietzsche's philosophy. Solomon, as you'll read in more detail later, says wants to point out, look, not all ad hominems are, are fallacious. Some certainly are. But when there's no such available truth or proof or when the argument is essentially incomplete with no end and end of counter examples and counter arguments in sight, then the ad hominem arguments become peculiar, uh, particularly appealing and appropriate. Of course, there are bad odd ad hominem arguments, he says, uh, namely those that are unsound or simply where the person doesn't have the characteristic attributed to them and those that invoke irrelevant features that are irrelevant to the thesis or the argument at hand or simply uh, luxuriate in their nastiness. So again, we're going to have to worry about whether Socrates is uh, getting ad hominem criticisms from Nietzsche and whether Nietzsche is getting ad hominem cr cr uh, criticisms from others. And then there's this genetic fallacy. It has to do with origins, right? Genesis, origins. Um, you know who invented the genetic engineering, right? Genetic engineering, right? Nazis, that's who. So obviously genetic engineering has to be rejected and immoral because Nazis came up with it. So it's not a fallacy, uh, the genetic fallacy, because I mentioned genetic engineering here. It's genetic because it has to do with the origins. So the origins of genetic engineering is a practice in science where the Nazis, right, they came up with it historically. That's who developed, first developed it. Um, and so they're bad, right? And so genetic engineering must be bad. So this kind of fallacy occurs 
when we conflate the content of a belief or a theory with the origins of its theory. So think about how, you know, this is similar to ad hominem. The, if, if there's something nasty about the origin of the person that came up with the theory, we might be connect, kind of committing an ad hominem and a genetic fallacy at the same time. Informal fallacies, unlike formal fallacies, multiple ones can occur in the same argument. There's no, since they're not structural, they have to do with content and context. So there's some ambiguity sometimes in them. Um, so it's the genesis, right? The origins is conflated with the content of the belief. So if we maybe take the origins to be noble or praiseworthy or blameworthy um, or deplorable, then we might accept or reject the belief itself based on its origins. The reason this comes up in Nietzsche is because he used uh, the genealogical method and tried to trace the origins of morality, and he traces them back to resentment. So how does tracing, if that's true, if uh, compassion, pity, justice, all of these things are really rooted in resentment rather than any kind of noble motives, you know, uh, uh, morally uh, praiseworthy uh, attributes, um, then does that show that they're false in some way? So Nietzsche says historical refutation is a definitive ref refutation. In former times, he writes, one sought to prove that there is no God. Today, one indicates how the belief that there is no God arose, right? Where did it come from? What was its genesis? And how this belief acquired its weight and importance. A counterproof that there is no God thereby becomes superfluous. So if we identify the origins, so if, if the origins of religious belief and belief in God is fear, does that mean that God, it's false that God exists? There's the, the potentially fallacious move there. So again, Nietzsche aims to uncover the historical and psychological origins of European morality, but does, that, uh, does doing that debunk it? Uh, what is Nietzsche's argument there, and what's its most plausible form, and then, you know, does it really commit the genetic fallacy? So we'll look at that a couple of times this semester, particularly when we get, um, not only in the earlier works, like in Daybreak, but in, um, you know, genealogy and morals, uh, certainly. And this is, again, a, a point that Solomon brings up. He says, Nietzsche's aware of the genetic fallacy and even warns against it, in this passage from the gay science. So, you know, we need to be careful in evaluating whether or not Nietzsche's genealogical method, for example, commits the genetic fallacy, uh, or if his psychological observations about religious belief debunk uh, religious beliefs. Does that show that they're false in some way? So we've got two fallacies to worry about, ad hominem and genetic fallacy. And then to that, we also need to worry about self-contradictions. So free contradictions, one dollar. There's an implicit contradiction there. Free is not the exact opposite content-wise as it costs a dollar. But if it costs a dollar, then that implies that it's not free. And there we have a direct contradiction, explicit contradiction between our sign and the implication of costing a dollar, namely that it's not free. So we get a direct uh, explicit contradiction there. Contradictions are one of the ways in which arguments can fail. They have a self-contradiction. So we've got the law of non-contradiction stated a few different ways from Socrates and Aristotle, um, but they all amount to the same basic thing. Um, a proposition or a statement can't be both true and its opposite can't both be true at the same time in the same respect. So Socrates, the same thing clearly cannot act or be acted upon in the same part or in relation to the same thing at the same time in contrary ways. It's impossible that the same thing belong and not belong to the same thing at the same time in the same respect. No one can believe the same thing at the same time, can and be and not be. You can believe it. It's just, you know, we start to question your sanity at that point. Uh, Aristotle also says the most certain of all basic principles is that contradictory propositions cannot be true simultaneously. It's not possible to say truly at the same time that the same thing is and is not a man. Right? So again, the way I usually say it is that a statement or a proposition uh, and its opposite, its negation, can't both be true at the same time in the same respect. We can illustrate this using the old square of opposition that comes from Aristotle. We can see that 
all S's are P's is the contradiction of some S's are not P's, and no S is P is the contradiction of some S's are P's, and vice versa. So universal affirmative, particular negative, universal negative, particular affirmative, those are contradictory relationships. So we know that both of those propositions, all S's are P's and some S's are not P's, they can't both be true at the same time in the same respect. You don't have to prove that no S is a P in order to prove that all S's are P's is false. You just have to prove that one S is not a P. So this gets us to the idea of a self-contradiction. And these are claims, theories, or arguments that ultimately prove themselves false because their truth would require the truth of a contradiction. Since contradictions can't be true, we know that theory has to be false. Something's got to be wrong with it. If it's an argument, either one of the premise or one of the premises has to be false, or the conclusion would have to be false. That's where the contradiction lies. Other ways of saying the same thing are, you know, phrases like self-defeating, self-refuting, self-referential, incoherence, etc. And then self-contradictions, you can spot them because they have kind of three basic features. They'll posit a, a, a criteria and a standard, or they'll affirm or deny something. The content of that claim that affirms or denies or posits the criteria applies to itself, so it's self-referential. I'm a bald guy. If I make claims about all bald guys, then I'm making a claim that is self-referential because I'm included in the class of all bald guys. Right? And then C, that statement doesn't meet its own criterion, or so it violates the law of non-contradiction. So if the claim posits a criteria or a standard or affirms or denies something, um, then the claim that it affirms or denies applies to that claim itself. It's self-referential and it violates the law of non-contradiction. Then you got a self-defeating claim. So let's take an example here. And this is just an example that you've gone over in the reading assignment from Johnson to tie that back in here. So relativism is one of the things he discussed in that article, and he discusses a couple of different types of relativism. The first one is individual relativism, and he defines it as just the thesis that there are no universal truths. And so we got three questions to ask ourselves. Does that thesis assert or posit a claim or affirm or deny something or assert a standard or a criteria, for example? Um, is it self-referential? In other words, does the content of the proposition apply to that proposition itself? And then does the thesis violate the law of non-contradiction? And so um, first question here. Yeah, the claim denies that there are any truths that are universal. So they could only be particular truths or true for particular people. There's no universal truths at all. Now that claim asserts a truth itself, but it doesn't assert a particular truth. It asserts a universal truth itself. In fact, it's universal negative that there are none of a certain kind of truth, right? You know, namely universal ones. Um, but if it's the case that there are no universal truths is a true statement, then that means there is at least one, and here comes the self-referential and potentially confusing thing here, but if you just think through it, you'll see the self-referential nature of it. That claim asserts a universal truth, but it denies that there are any universal truths, right? It implicitly asserts that itself is true while it explicitly denies that there are any universal truths, so we get a contradiction. So as Johnson points out um, here, uh, this is a problematic claim. Uh, he says, or consider whether Colbert is funny. You think he's hilarious. Your mother doesn't get it, but neither of you is right or wrong. Um, the individual relativist thinks all truths are like this, but obviously this cannot be the case. For example, whether or not you exist is a matter of is not a matter of convention or taste. If someone believes you, uh, if someone believes that you don't exist, it's not true for them. Your existence is a matter of fact. Uh, they believe, may believe you don't exist, but their belief is just false. Uh, it, relativism, says there are no universal truths, but isn't the individual relativist trying to establish that individual relativism is universally true? How can it be universally true that there are no universal truths? So he's asking a rhetorical question there to drive home the point that it's a self-contradiction going on there. So again, just walking through that um, little process. Individual relativism denies there are universal truths, but it asserts a universal truth itself. Um, 
So we get this contradiction that there are no universal truths and that there are some universal truths, but both of those can't be true at the same time. So which one do we know is true? If they, We know that they both can't be true at the same time in the same respect. Which one is true? Well, the one that generated the contradiction is, is self-contradictory, has to be false, so we know that the other one has to be true. Why does this pop up with Nietzsche? Well, because Nietzsche, why does relativism pop up and this issue of self-contradiction pop up? Because Nietzsche says stuff like this, there are only facts. I, I would say no, facts are is precisely what there is not, only interpretations. We cannot establish any fact in itself Perhaps it is folly to want such a thing. So that, in the minds of, and we'll go into this more detail later, but, um, you know, in the minds of, of many commentators and many other philosophers, that looks like a self-contradictory sort of claim. And so here's an example of a philosopher raising this issue uh, in the commentary about Nietzsche. It comes from Alistair McIntyre in his book, Three Rival Versions, where he says, uh, he's talking about criticisms of Nietzsche, and he says, uh, you know, a standard way of thinking about this a kind of commentary is to claim something like this that Nietzsche has surely committed himself uh, has surely committed himself it has been argued for example the thesis that all claims are true can only be true made from a standpoint afforded by some particular perspective there is no such thing as truth as such but only truth from one or another point of view but this is of course it, 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 excuse me but this is of course itself so the commentators go on, a universal non-perspectival theory of truth. Looks like a contradiction. So, you know, Nietzsche claims um, that philosophical beliefs are an unconscious personal confession of the philosopher and not an objective or impartial truth. But then what does that mean about Nietzsche's own philosophy? For example, there's the self-referential question, and then we have to figure out whether that self-referential question is going to also involve some kind of self-contradiction or self-defeating claim there. So to start wrapping up a little bit, we need to think about contradictions and ad hominem fallacies and genetic fallacies um, in Nietzsche's thought and related to Nietzsche's thought. We need to worry about, you know, whether Nietzsche's own arguments are fallacious or self-contradictory uh, when he's arguing for, you, you know, um, moral skepticism or critiquing truth, for example, or denying free will, but then asserting that we can, you know, become who we are and that we can en engage in some kind of uh, some kind of project of self-creation. Are the criticisms of Nietzsche themselves fallacious, maybe based on straw men or uncharitable interpretations of his work? So there's a little bit of work to do there because Nietzsche, you know, he doesn't write like other philosophers, it lends itself to different interpretations. So it's a thing we're going to have to worry about there is figuring out what Nietzsche's arguments actually are. Or is Nietzsche's philosophy just another form of mere sophistry, rhetoric, and a form of truthiness, you know? Again, Nietzsche's philosophy, um, if we can call it that, his thought, um, his works, often raise the question of what counts as philosophy, certainly what counts as good philosophy, and how to go about doing it. And so this is one of our background questions for the, our guiding questions throughout the whole semester. So keep these two fallacies and the problem of self-contradiction in mind when we're reading Nietzsche, when you're reading about Nietzsche's philosophy uh, and other criticisms of it from the standpoint of other scholars and criticisms and critics. And forming your own views about uh, and developing your own arguments and evaluations, particularly those about Nietzsche's philosophy itself. Um, you know, your job in this class is to always try to give a criticism or an analysis or present an argument and defend a thesis with a well-reasoned argument that doesn't commit any of these sorts of kinds of these sorts of errors, either contradictions or formal or informal fallacies. And so, you know, you need to keep them th these sort of stuff in mind on several fronts throughout the semester. So with that, um, we can get on to the business of uh, digging into Nietzsche's works and figuring out what his views are and, you know, whether or not some of the popular opinions about his thoughts and ideas are uh, justified or not. Uh, so we'll wrap it up there and I will see you all in class.